song for years, be not dismayed, whatever be tied, God will. And you know the hymn, come on here now. Uh, through days of toil, when your heart does fail, God will take care of you. When dangers fierce, your path assail, God will. Oh, all you may need, he will provide. God will. Nothing you ask shall, be, I love this verse, nothing you ask shall be denied because God will. No matter what the test, God will. Lean, weary one, upon his breast because God will. <laughs> when you look at that old hymn of the church, an, an old lady on her deathbed, said to her husband who was on his way to a church meeting, he was contemplating whether or not he should leave or stay. She looks at him, she tells him, you go on, God will take care of you. She's the one sick now. But she tells him, you go on, God will take care of you. In his absence, she leans over and gets a pen and she begins to write. And she writes out this whole song, be not dismayed, whatever be tied, God will take care of you. Now this song is significant as we look at our text for this evening. The Psalter, Psalms 34, the Psalter contains 14 Psalms introduced by words linking them to the incidents in the life of King David. The title of Psalm 34 says that it was written in a time when David was pretending to be insane. David was acting like he was a retarded. He was acting like a crazy man before Abimelech who drove him away and David left. Now the incident which refers to is recorded actual in 1 Samuel, uh, the 21st chapter, verses 10 through 15. David was fleeing from his great army, his, this great enemy of his, uh, King Saul. And his circumstances seemed to be so desperate that he left his own homeland and went to the coastal area of the Palestine to seek asylum with Achish, the king of Gath. David must have been extremely desperate because Gath, and I need you to catch this, to, to run to Gath, for David to run to Gath, it shows how much of a desperate situation he was in back home because Gath was actually the home of Goliath. The Philistine champion whom David had just killed years before. Now you know you got to be something, something to show up in the hometown of a giant you just killed. You just killed their champion and then you show up a few years later. He shows up there, and you know, uh, when you really look at the thing, he shows up there, and, and just before going to Gath, he had received Goliath's sword from Abimelech, one of the priests of Nah. We can suppose that the very sight of the sword must have been an offense to those who were standing there upon David's arrival. David seemed to have been in danger because the story says that he was so much afraid of a kish that he pretended to be a madman. When you study this text here, David is pretending to be a madman. When a kish, when they come up, David is standing outside of the city gates, and you got to be able to have a, a pictorial view in your mind of this. David is standing out there. He has saliva running all down his beard. His hair is looking like a wild man. His clothes is not hanging on him properly. And when they ride up, he's out there with a stone or stick just making crazy marks on the gates of the city. A kish rides up looks at him and he says, am I so short of madmen that you bring this man to me? And he tells them, get him out of here. In other words, the kid said, I got enough crazy folk around here and I don't have room for another one. And he tells them to get David out of here. Now, the voices of the church, most of the voices of the church are the commentators believe that this was a very sad episode in the life of David's life since he was obviously, it seemed that he had failed to trust God to protect him from Saul and he was relying on his own cunningness instead of trusting God. So whether that is true or not, David nevertheless, he finally cries out for help and he was delivered. 
Psalm 34 makes it crystal clear. In 1 Samuel, we are told that he escaped from Gath and fled to the cave of Adullam. Everybody say Adullam where this psalm is supposed to have been written. Now, I need you to catch this on today. He, he's down in the cave of Adullam. Where was Psalm 34 written? Look at your neighbor and say, in a cave. <laughs> you you got to hear this now. It's written in a cave. Psalm 34 is actually quoted twice in the New Testament. And it may be alluded to in other passages. Verse 12 through 16 are actually quoted by Peter as a promise of God's blessings for those who live a godly life. That's found in 1 Peter 3, 10 through 12. And then verse 20 of this psalm is actually quoted by John as having been fulfilled at the time of Jesus' crucifixion. This is what it says. He protects all of his bones and not a one of them will be broken. Now, we usually quote that around Easter time, but it predates that all the way back to the cave of Adullam. This psalm is actually divided into two parts. Number one, it is a testimony coupled with encouragement to praise and to trust God. The second thing, it is a set of wise observations based on the experiences in David's life. Now stay with me here. And so when you look at this psalm collectively together, uh, one of the great voices of the church, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, he called the first 10 verses, he said, it sounds like a good hymn. He said, but then when you look at the last 12, he said, it's a good sermon. <laughs> I like Paul Spurgeon. When you really look at this thing, and I told you divided into two parts, and the first part is divided up as encouragement to praise and to trust God. Verse 1 through 3 is an invitation to praise God. Look at what it says real quickly on this evening. I will bless the Lord. Now, wait a minute now. I, I just told you that Psalm 34 was written in a cave. He's in the cave of Adullam. He's fleeing for his life. He's in fear. He's not even sure if he's going to make it out of the alive. But yet he sits in his cage, and the first thing he pins is, I will bless the Lord at all times. What, what do you say when you find yourself in your cave? What's the first thing to come out of your mouth when trouble comes to your doorstep? What is the first thing you find yourself speaking when you find yourself in a dilemma? You got to understand about the law of confession. You got to be able to say what you expect God to do. What David was saying right here. <laughs> He's saying that, that this, this here grace of God and this favor of God, it will mend a broken heart, but it doesn't prevent the heart from being broken again. What he's saying here, it will restore the spiritually crushed, but it does not crush the force that created the oppression. You see, deliverance is one thing. Exemption from trouble is another. And so David said, I'm not trying to mislead you. And I'm not trying to misguide you. I don't want you to think that the righteous is exempt from trouble. Come here, Job, and clear it up. Man that is born of a woman is here but for a few days, and those days are full of trouble. One virgin takes the word affliction in the text and substitute it for the word trouble. And I got to get out of here. And that's all right. Because when you look at the word affliction in our text for this evening, it could easily be translated as many are the troubles of the righteous. Many are the sufferings of the righteous. Many are the difficulties of the righteous. I'll be down your street in a minute. Many are the burdens of the righteous. Many are the problems of the righteous. Many are the hardships of the righteous. Many are the pain of the righteous. Many are the miseries of the righteous. Many are the misfortunes of the righteous. Many are the troubles of the righteous. But, 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 I don't care 
what I got to go through as long as somewhere in the text there is a conjunction there is a word but because that simply means that God is getting ready to turn this thing around many are the afflictions of the righteous but he's going to turn this thing around but he's getting ready to switch this thing but he's going to flip this thing around but Lord have mercy I got to get out of here I wish I had time to finish this story trouble will always be a part of our lives there is no guarantee for a trouble free life many are the troubles but I'm so glad in his closeness to us he delivers y'all don't hear me because the Lord is close he delivers me because I have a close relationship with my father he delivered me the guarantee that I have that I'm coming out of this and that the Lord and I we got a relationship the Lord and I we are love the one another he loved me and I love him we are love us Lord have mercy Lord have mercy Lord have mercy got to get out of here afflictions come from every point of the compass but the Lord delivers us out of them all as I come to my close tell your neighbor I found I found a guarantee in the Word of God that I'm coming out of this grab your paper I said grab your paper and tell your neighbor I found a guarantee in the Word of God that I, I'm coming out of this whatever your this is you're coming out of it whatever your affliction is you're coming out of it whatever your pain is you're coming out of it whatever you're suffering with you're coming out of it whatever your trouble is you're coming out of it but the bible says you got to say it yourself you got to speak it open up your mouth and say ah, i'm coming out of this ah, i'm coming out of this say yeah no more tears no more worrying no more pacing the floor i'm coming out of this i'm coming out of this i'm coming out of this i gotta close here whatever tribulation whatever affliction that god is allowing you to experience hear me now god knows how and god knows when to bring it to a close he knows how to shut the devil down when the test gets a little too hot when it looks like you can't hold on no more he knows how to shut the devil down but what god is waiting on is for that trouble for that tribulation to have its complete work inside of you so after you've been purged after you've been sanctified after you've been built up after the trouble has done its complete work tell your neighbor god's gonna shut it down tell him god's gonna shut it down and that's what i'm coming out of this I gotta close. I gotta close. But apostle, when I wrote this, I sat there. I said, what give David the right to pin these words? That many are the afflictions of the righteous. But no matter what it is, God will deliver. What give David the right? to sit in the cave of Adullam huh, and write such a powerful word huh, and then have it existing huh, that we read it right here today. Huh. Well, then I thought about it. Huh. 
that while David was sitting in the cave of Adullam, writing with his pen, David could reminisce. I said, David could reminisce that when I was in trouble with the bear, he brought me out of there. When I was in trouble in the lion den, he brought me out of that. When I was in trouble with Mr. Saul, God covered me. When I was in trouble in the Philistine camp, he brought me out of that. So David had a right to say that God will, God will, God will deliver you. I got the clothes, but just like he brought Israel out of Egypt, Job out of his dilemma, John up out of the Patmos, Peter out of jail, Paul from free shipwrecks. I got a right because I belong to him to declare I'm coming out of this. I'm coming out of this. I got five things that I wrote down in the face of the devil. And I want the devil to know I'm coming out of this. I'm coming out of that. And I'm coming out of this. And I'm coming out of that. And I'm coming out of this. I don't ask the devil. I'm telling the devil that I, I'm coming out. Tell somebody, I'm coming out of this. <laughs>